Ladies and gentlemen, we are heading now into our next session. So as we all know, 2020 was really the rise of home office as a new global common practice. But what are the longer term effects of this trend on transport systems when we look into the transport and mobility systems? I'd like to introduce you now to an inspirational talk again with um, Dr. Lisa Ruhrort concerning the topic, can telework transform the transport? And your questions, of course, will be answered live by Lisa as um, there's nothing that has to do with magic, I know, because we're going to see her in a pre-recorded session in a moment, but she's going to be live with us. I can see you, Lisa, nice that you are joining us. So thanks again for your time and, of course, for answering live in the chat the question that come up. Um, uh, from our audiences, and I'm really thrilled now to look into the video. But before that, being a soci sociologist by education, maybe you can give us a glimpse what has sparked your interest in the political steering of sustainable transport policies on one side, and of course what motivates you to research further and in depth in this field. Yes, thanks a lot uh, for, for the opportunity to be here with you. Um, well. I have been doing research on the transport sector for about 15 years. So um, I have for a long time been merging the sociological perspective with uh, questions of transportation research. And the reason for this obviously is that uh, transport is a cultural phenomenon and ideas and um, conceptualizations, especially of what, the, what constitutes a good life and a good society, have always shaped our transport systems uh, in a big way and are still shaping them right now. And um, I am fascinated and motivated in my work very much by the changes that I see already, um, especially in Germany uh, where I live. Um, of course, Germany is probably not the easiest uh, place in the world for a transport transition. As you mentioned already, uh, we have this uh, very high uh, importance of the car industry, of course. But nonetheless, I have seen during those 15 years that I've been studying it, uh, I would say substantial uh, change sort of in the right direction, especially culturally. Um, and I'm going to go into that, of, uh, of course, in the talk as well. Um, so the, the changes are still sort of small in, in comparison to the, to the overall transport system that we have. But uh, changes such as the rise of cycling in many cities and a sort of new cultural perspective on cycling um, are very encouraging. And now I think coronavirus and the pandemic, even though they are horrible, have brought sort of windows of opportunity for change. And this is what I want to talk about. Thank you very much. Listening to the last hours of our conference, is there something that you can share with us that has given you, of course, the courage and that has shown you that a sustainable transport uh, transformation is possible, is perfectly feasible? Is there something that stood out for you? Well, I think listening just now to the talk, um, I heard about the, the importance of uh, new narratives. And uh, this is something that I wholeheartedly agree to. And I think the point that I want to stress is that the new narratives need to be also um, pushed by those who are the most privileged in the society. And um, also in Germany, even though, of course, Germany is a very rich country, we still see these disparities between uh, the transport consumption of the richest versus the, the, the poorer uh, segments of society. And I think this is something that binds the, the whole global conversation together. We need new narratives of a good life with fewer trips and more sustainable trips. And this needs to be very much pushed also by the people who now consume the most uh, travel, uh, which is sort of the most privileged parts of society. And I think, I think if we start to understand this and if the people who are privileged start to push for this change and to, to show that a different life is possible, then we can see substantial change. Absolutely. Lisa, thank you so much for these glimpses. Now we're going to head into your keynote. And of course, you're going to be available online in the live chat. So please enjoy the audience. Uh, Lisa Ruhrort and her keynote. Music 
In March 2020, so around four days before the first lockdown, I traveled 800 miles to attend a two-day conference. And in my talk on that conference, I said that in the future we are going to have to reduce our overall travel demand. So we're going to have to travel less. It's not enough to just shift to electric mobility, for instance, but we also have to find a way of finding a good life with less travel. And after my talk, a member of the audience came to me and he asked me, do you really honestly believe that we could ever have this type of uh, tremendous change that we can actually move towards a life with less travel in our society? Uh, he just couldn't believe it. It seemed um, unimaginable to him. Well, now almost one year after that, uh, we have all collectively experienced that this type of rapid change can actually happen to us. At the moment, many of us are working from home instead of commuting daily to our workplace. Many of us have replaced business travel with telemeetings. And in many German cities, um, the rate of cycling has gone up by up to 20%. And cycling shops have been overwhelmed with demand because so many more people are cycling as they move more in their immediate vicinity. Now, what can we learn from this collective disruptive experience? Well, I think we can learn that under certain circumstances, rapid change can happen much more quickly than we expect. And that as where windows for change can open up, that can potentially be used to shift towards more sustainable travel patterns. Now, of course, the corona pandemic um, is an example of change by disaster. It's brought suffering to millions of people worldwide. And this is, of course, not what anybody wants for our future. But the question is, can we have change by design instead of change by disaster? And telework is a very interesting example for this. So without any political steering and without intervention, telework as a trend can even have adverse effects for sustainable mobility. First of all, in the pandemic, we've seen that mostly privileged groups of society have actually the opportunity to work from home. So it's mostly high income people who can now use this option at the moment. And secondly, without political intervention, telework as a trend can uh, have strong rebound effects. So it can lead to the effect that many people are motivated to move even further away from their workplace um, so that the distance that they need to travel to work is even larger and the miles saved can be replaced by fewer trips but longer trips. So what can transport policy do to steer this trend of home office of telework in the direction of sustainability? I want to make um, four points that show how change by design can be possible. First of all, ensure a more equitable access to the option of home office and make sure that not only the most high income groups can use this option of, of working from home. And at the same time, make sure that people who do work from home have good working conditions. Secondly, use the opportunity to strengthen um, local slow modes of transport. For example, Berlin, as well as other cities in the world, have been very successful at um, creating new space for cycling, for example, during the pandemic. So they have used this window of opportunity to create so-called pop-up bike lanes, where space is taken away from car travel and awarded to safe infrastructure for cycling. And this is an opportunity because people travel more in their immediate surroundings when they work from home to actually strengthen this, these slower modes. Thirdly, um, phase out subsidies for long distance travel. So Germany, for example, is still spending billions each year uh, for tax breaks for long distance commuting as well as flying. And uh, these tax breaks mostly benefit the most high income households. Uh, this money could much better be spent uh, in, for programs to support lower income families who often cannot have the option of working from home. And last but not least, 
use the opportunity to support a cultural shift. We come from a culture which for decades has uh, associated travel with wealth and with social status. And to reach our climate targets, we have to move towards a vision of the future of a good life with less travel. And this type of cultural shift is possible, but it can only work if it starts at the top of the social ladder, where people now actually travel the most and have um, the most access to travel options. So these privileged groups need to start by showing how a good life with less travel can be possible. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Lisa Ruhrort, for joining us, of course, in the Transport and Climate Change Week, and of course, for your contribution and your live um, answering of the chat question. So thanks again for joining us, Lisa.